What was your biggest, aw crap, no going back now, moment? Story 1. Refusing to serve a customer for the first time ever. It may seem small, but it felt like a big win. I work at a cafe, and a woman very rudely asked me for a 16-ounce hot coffee. We don't offer that. We just make pour-overs. Yeah, we're an expensive bougie shop. And I tried to kindly explain to her why, but told her I could make her two coffees if she likes, as long as I stick with the recipe. She demanded I change the recipe. I said, no, I can't. She spotted a 16-ounce cup behind me and asked, well, what's that? Things were already very tense, and I grabbed the cup and explained, this is a 16-ounce cup, but it's only for cold brew. It looks similar to the hot cups, but this one is compostable, made from sugar cane, and will melt if hot liquid is poured into it. She grabbed it out of my hand and demanded I make her two coffees and pour them into the cup. I said, I can't do that, the cup will melt. She told me she would do it herself, which also wouldn't work because she would have 24 ounces of coffee for a 16-ounce cup. At this point, other customers were in there giving me the, oh crap, she's crazy, I'm sorry you're dealing with this, sympathetic eye. I knew if she poured the coffee into that cup and burned herself, we would have a bigger issue. I said, I can't do that, I'm sorry. She demanded I make it again, saying, you will make me two coffees. She spoke to me so horribly and condescendingly, there was never a please, and spoke to me like a servant, and she was creating a safety hazard. I took a long pause and looked her right in the eye and said, I'm sorry, I can't let you speak to me that way, and I won't serve you. She was shocked. She was appalled. The cafe was silent. My coworker came out from the back, and the customer held her card out to her and said, She won't help me, so you will. I'll have two coffees. And my coworker looked at her and said, uh, I don't know what's happening because I just got here, but I trust my coworker, so I'm sorry, but I won't serve you. It was so cool. Yes, the woman yelled at us, berated us, mocked my voice, claimed I called her abusive, screamed that we were wrong, demanded our names and corporate's contact. I stayed so calm the entire time. Once she left, multiple regulars and customers offered to back me up if I needed support, explaining the situation to my manager. I've worked at my company for years and am consistent and trusted. I called my boss immediately and explained the situation. They received an angry voicemail within minutes and stood by me and my coworker, sending a generic, sorry about your experience email, but not offering her any compensation. It was seriously one of the best feelings. I stood my ground when in the past I've crumbled or allowed myself to be treated poorly in these types of situations. I asked for the respect I deserve as a human being and my coworkers and bosses supported me. Try it out sometime, it rules. Story 2. Getting admitted into a psychiatric ward at 17. I was going through an emo phase, dyed my hair blue-black, started listening to loud, edgy music, wore skinny jeans, the whole shebang. I always was a shy, sheltered kid that didn't have many friends. School was my number one priority and had daily classes from the morning till late in the evening. I was also secretly gay, living in a deeply religious family. Video games were my only outlet. When the school stuff started getting harder and demanding more and more of my time, it got harder for me to juggle between getting my homework done and getting my dopamine rush. Suddenly, I started wondering why I put that much effort into school in the first place, only to get mediocre results. My grades weren't bad, probably the equivalent of a B+, but not getting an A still made me feel like I had failed. I was also routinely bullied, so I figured that if my grades fell, I would make myself less of a target. To cut to the chase, I tried to make myself more likable and got acquainted with emo and alternative culture. Boy, did my mom not like that. She started wondering why her son turned from a nerd to this circus act, straight up asking me if I was doing drugs. I wasn't, by the way, but it didn't matter. She figured there's something wrong with me, so she started dragging me around from one psychiatrist to the other. When the doctor eventually said that there's nothing wrong with me and it's just normal teenage hormones, we would immediately visit another doctor to get a second opinion. Eventually, she booked an appointment with the head of a psychiatric facility for which she paid an exorbitant amount of money, around 200 euros, which was four times larger than the hourly rate of the previous doctors. She asked me a few questions, most of which were answered immediately by my mom, and after about five minutes, gave me a depression diagnosis. He said that I'd need to start taking antidepressants and that I'd need to stay in a psychiatric ward for a week so that they can monitor my body's reaction to the medication and do further tests. 
Now, I wasn't planning on going through with it, but after some pressure, I started believing that maybe he knows better and there's actually something wrong with me. So I went along. This screwed me up in more ways than I care to recall. I eventually shifted from diagnosis to diagnosis and all kinds of different meds. The crap I saw during my multiple stays there scarred me for life. I'm almost 28 now, still living at my mom's house. I've been off the meds for around seven years. I recently got admitted to a uni to study Internet of Things abroad. I'm planning on leaving after this summer. Story 3. While motorcycling through Vietnam, it was getting late and I was running low on fuel. Too low to turn back to the previous town. If that wasn't bad enough, my bike rack broke. Luckily, a kind man and his daughter stopped to help. He knew no English outside of, I can fix. So I followed him, I wore my bags and held the rest on my lap. Entering the town, my jaw dropped. It was a complete calamity. The streets were filled with people carrying 2 by 4s rocks and bottles, literally hundreds of people. It was like a war zone. With people smashing scooters and cars on fire, people yelling and fighting, a few individuals were running for their lives with mobs in tail. I can still vividly see one man's face as he looked over his shoulder in dread. There were too many people to drive through, so I had to slow down to a crawl. All I kept thinking was, please don't notice me, please don't rob me and smash my face in. Please know I'm with this kind man and his daughter. The moment lengthened as a few of the town folks started to notice me. I was scared crapless, but produced a warm smile. The smile wasn't returned. The kind man looked back and those who were taking interest in me noticed. Can't help but think it helped. We finally breached the throng of people and pulled down an alleyway to his place. I still didn't feel safe, but I needed gas and my rack fixed. I tried to ask the man why all these people were fighting one another. He just smiled and made the drink gesture. It was during Tet or the Vietnamese New Year. He fixed my rack, gave me some gas, and wouldn't take any money as payment. However, like Christmas, the kids receive money, so I gave his daughter a fat wad of cash, with his blessing. About 45 minutes later, I arrived safely at my hostel in Nirvana. Story 4. Moving to Europe. For my husband, it was moving home. For me, yeah, nope. But I have a rare disease, and American insurance was about to actually kill me, kept denying medications. I was getting worse and worse, and he managed to get an amazing job in a great city to try to save my life. So five years ago, we were two hours into our flight there, the flight where we're moving forever, and I was too sick to visit first or anything, so I've never seen it before, and I'm realizing I'm not actually well enough to fly back to the US. Who knows when I'll see anything or anyone from there again. And this is it. And suddenly, I'm just a bit panicky. Like, what is a plane? Where is the air? The flight attendant was offering me a cup of tea at that exact moment, and I just stared at my husband, who's a former Marine, and has done all of these insane things. And he looked at me and went, take the tea. I felt like an idiot version of Neo in the Matrix. If you take the tea, the flight keeps going, and you see how far this rabbit hole goes. If you don't take the tea, this poor flight attendant stands here looking like a freaking idiot for even longer. So anyway, I took the tea from the dude, and then I guess it worked because who can panic while trying to make tea? Turns out it was truly the point of no return. It's been five years. The insurance is much better than the US. They've kept me alive when I definitely would have died, but I'm too sick to actually leave. I couldn't even go home for my grandmother's funeral. So crap, there really was no going back. Unless something kicks in, new treatments or whatever, I doubt I'll ever see home again. Story 5. This one is quite literally a not going back moment. As a boy scout at summer camp, we would always take large group hikes on the last day of camp. This particular camp in West Texas was located in the middle of the deep canyon and cut through with a small stream. The day before our hike day, it rained a bit, but not too much to make us worry. It was drizzling in the morning when we got up, but we were Boy Scouts, so that obviously didn't stop us. So our long hike had us cross the small stream up the canyon, maybe 10 to 15 times, no problem, and everything went great. After a while, we got to a medium-sized pond that we all decided to go swimming in. That was fun, and we all had a blast. We get out and dressed, and we keep going farther up a hill to continue our hike. We get to the top, and we hear this wonderfully ominous rushing noise. We looked over a ledge and saw that the water in the stream was moving a bit faster than we remembered. A friend and I volunteered to go back and see what's happened. A flash flood had ripped through the area we had just left moments before. 
The water in the pond was at least seven feet higher than it was five minutes before, and it was covered in foam and rapidly overflowing. We decided as a group to test our luck and go back to see if we could get out, but the last stream crossing had turned into a very fast-moving river crossing. Needless to say, we were freaked. We literally couldn't go back, and we had to wait a long time to get help and get to the now almost flooded camp. Story 6. When I asked my crush if she's ready for a relationship with me, the two hours I waited for a reply took forever. Also, sadly, she said no. Edit. Yeah, okay, I think that blew up a bit. Just to clarify, I really had tough feelings for her, and every time we spoke, I thought that there was something. After literally one whole year, I finally asked her, like an idiot, on WhatsApp, that question. She said, no, sorry, and I said that it was okay and dumb for me to ask, and she said sorry again. I told her that I don't want anyone to know. Well, crap, here I am on the internet, and pretend like this never happened. After that, I didn't feel empty or some other stuff. I just felt that everything that I built up to this moment was for nothing. Thanks for the support. By the way, I know that it was stupid and like a child would do, but I didn't know better. Now I do, and I'm starting to get feelings for her. Maybe let's see how the second try is. Story 7. Hiking backcountry snowboarding with a guy. Got stuck in a flat area and needed to hike out in deep powder. It was getting dark and kept coming out of thick trees to 50-foot-plus cliff areas. It was getting darker and we didn't have much light left and finally came out to another cliff area with about a 10-foot cliff, 20 feet of landing and then a second 10-foot cliff area that had a narrow landing to an open glade. It was either go for it and not fall and get hurt or start making a snow tunnel and get ready to sleep on the mountain for the night at East Vale Chutes in Colorado. We both made it through the cliff jump safely, but it was sketchy. When we got to the town, we both had a couple tall whiskeys and the first bar we got to, and I was still shaking. Could have possibly become unalive if we had to stay on the mountain overnight or got seriously hurt and then passed away, making the jumps to get to an area we could get down as it was getting dark, but I was either jump or start making a snow shelter. We were definitely not prepared with backcountry gear and got lost in the area, even though we had both ridden it a few times with some experienced people who had taken us down before scary, and something I will never forget. Story 8. That morning, I gave away furniture and cleaned out a lot of my room before stepping into my friend's vehicle to take a ride to the bus trip. I was moving a thousand miles away from my old home and out of my father's house that morning, two and a half years ago. Edit. Since some people have asked, I was 28 at the time. It was my second move out when my five years prior, I moved out at 23 with my sister at the time. That didn't really work out at all. Who am I with now? Eh, he could be better. Nice, kind, and not too bad. It's just he's an admitted man-child, doesn't do an awful lot of cleaning, worries about nonsensical things, and has me second-guessing on what he buys that gets me concerned about whether bills or rent are caught up, like buying plushies for either himself or his asocial of a prick fiancé. I told him that I plan on moving out in 2022, but earlier if things don't turn around before then, and I managed to get a job to save up. Story 9. Hiking, knowing that severe, severe weather is on the way. I got about eight miles in when it started. Dense woods, but rain was heavy enough that I couldn't see ten feet in front of me. Crossed a small creek halfway through, which, on my way back, turned into a river from flash floods. I found a somewhat large rock sticking out from a hill and huddled under that for about fifteen minutes, while lightning struck close enough to hurt my ears and seriously rumble in my chest. Ended up having to follow the creek upstream until it got small enough to cross, which turned what was originally two miles of hiking trail into probably another eight through raw forest, maybe more as it was pitch black when I got back to my car, and I had started at noon. Spent those hours bawling my eyes out and slipping into mud, easily in the top five most terrifying experiences in my life. Story 10. I hopped a freight train once, and the moment it hits 15 to 20 miles per hour, you're just along for the ride. But the real no-going-back moment came when the train stopped on a siding outside Winnemucca. After waiting there for like five hours, I decided to walk into town and get some ice cream sandwiches. As soon as I got 50 yards from the train, I realized if it starts rolling now, I'll be too far away to chase it down. I'll just be stuck in this town for a while. For you kids out there, riding freight trains is dangerous and illegal, and dirty and loud and unreliable. Don't do it. Also, I should point out that Winnemucca is home to some of America's best Basque restaurants, fantastic cowboy heritage sites, and it's the gateway to the Black Rock Desert. It's got something for everyone, not just stranded hobos. Story 11. 
got a general anesthetic for wisdom teeth removal. After waiting what felt like an eternity in a little prep room, I was just thinking about using the restroom just for something to do when I'm swarmed by nurses or whatever. Before I could react, they stuck things all over me and one of them got the drugs in me and I could immediately feel the effects. I remember vividly thinking, well frick, no going back now, as they wheeled me into the theater. And then the procedure and recovery went as smoothly as they could have gone. When I saw my girlfriend, now wife's, eyes light up at the jewelry store when she laid eyes on what would become the engagement ring, the last two months of talking about marriage suddenly felt more real and serious. Story 12. When I found out my husband at the time was still gaming behind my back, we had an almost one-year-old and he had been acting shady. I logged into his bank account where he had a secure credit card and saw all the transactions from the casinos. That was the third strike for me. I tried to get him help and support, and he crapped on my attempts every time. I'm not a bad enough gambler to be in Gamblers Anonymous. I just went to use the ATM and pay my phone bill. We don't need to pay a therapist to tell us we need to talk more. So he asked me to bring him lunch at work. I printed off the credit card statements, handed them to him with his lunch pail, and began the process of moving my things to my mom's house and looking for a place to live. Story 13. I ran away from an abusive home at 19, I called my dad while I was at work later that day to let him know that I was okay and not to come looking for me. He's a narcissist and I was so scared he'd tell the authorities something crazy so they'd track me down for him, like my brother had kidnapped me. I'd left my car keys on the kitchen table so he couldn't charge me with stealing it as he bought it for me, emptied my bank account because he was friends with a small bank owner, and taken everything I could with me. And that was a pretty big one. He said, you'll never make it without me and my money. And I just said, I can't wait to find out. That was seven years ago now, and I'm making it. Story 14. When I was younger, letting my older cousin talk me into a canoe ride down a flooded river. We'd planned it days in advance, but there was a lot of heavy rain in the area, and the normally calm river was near flood level and quite rough. I really didn't want to do it, but I didn't want to let him down either. So I still went. I knew as soon as we saw the river, this was a terrible idea. The whole thing was a crap show, and I honestly thought we were going to die. We had no control, and at one point, we got stuck nose down in a large rock, knowing if we tipped out, we were drowning. We somehow made it out and to the shore where we walked back with the canoe. Story 15. When my abusive husband was doing his weekly ritual of interrogating me and accusing me of some made-up infidelity and going, well, what's the deal here? Are we just done? Before I could stop myself, I was like, you know, yeah, yeah, we're done. He didn't know until that moment that I had already spoken to a divorce lawyer and the police and all of my ducks were in a row to take the frick off. But I was planning on actually meeting with the lawyer before I told him, so then it was just two weeks of awful Jekyll and Hyde bullcrap before I could leave. I have to say, even though I was like, oh crap, it did feel so freaking good to say it though. Screw that guy. Story 16. Here, try this hot wing. Took a bite, and for the next 18 hours, I could only focus on how this was a crime against humanity. And for those now asking, it was the last dab triple X on a drumstick. It was coated all over. I just ate one bite, and then I went and shoved my head under a cold shower. Then it was bed and bathroom for several hours, as I threw up most of it. But some got digested. I knew going in that it was going to be hot. My former roommate was a hot sauce aficionado. He never once handed me a wing that was less than a habanero sauce. The question was, am I about to have Ghost, Pepper X, Carolina Reaper, Habanero, etc.? Story 17. The other day I tried forcing the garage door closed while inside because it had been catching on something. It slid with a loud bang and I noticed the wire had disconnected from the springs. It wasn't going to open. It's like 800 pounds and the springs help carry the load of the door. So unless I got the wire back on the spring, I was basically trapped. I found some gloves and sunglasses hanging out in the garage already, not safety glasses, but better than nothing, and had to essentially hold the spring with one hand, the wire with the other, and do a chest fly to pull it into place. Adrenaline is a hell of a drug. Story 18. 1. When my wife showed me the positive pregnancy test while we were already in the process of adopting. Number 2. When the ultrasound tech said, and here's the second heartbeat. When I was on my way to see a girl I had been talking to online for three months who lived on the other side of the world. Just put all of my eggs in one basket and said, screw it. The crap, no going back now feeling really hit when the plane took off. That girl is now my wife. Sometimes you just gotta go for it. Story 19. Mountain biking with some friends on a new trail, which wasn't even a bike trail. We hiked most of the way up since it was too steep to ride up. 
carried our bikes all the way up, rested at the top for a bit, and then rolled over the edge. I remember as my front tire crested and gravity started taking over, I thought, there's no way I'm stopping now, unless a tree stops me. Story 20. I was meeting a guy on Grinder. I had pulled up into the driveway and still had the chance to leave, but it was a decent looking place, so I walked up to the front door. The moment I saw him in the window, well, even then I could back out, he opened the door and grabbed my hand. That was the moment. I couldn't go back at that moment. Two and a half years later, I'm going to marry this man. Story 21. Getting in the ambulance after suffering a grand mal seizure from alcohol withdrawals, when I finally said enough is enough and decided I needed to quit drinking before it killed me. I thought I could detox on my own as I was terrified of hospitals. I was wrong. I spent a week detoxing in the ICU, and now, almost a full year later, I'm still very happily sober, and I'm completely thriving. Story 22. That first time being dropped off on the Appalachian Trail several states away from home and watching the car speed off into the distance with nothing by my own legs and a stick I found to get me back. I love that stick. I would frick that stick if it had genitals. I'm butthurt that this is my top-rated comment so far, and because I didn't use lube. Story 23. Stepping off that sandbar, I could barely reach to swim out to the girl caught in a riptide, and not knowing how a riptide worked. It took what felt like hours, but spoiler alert, we made it. Too early into the season for lifeguards. I remember calling out to people walking their dogs on the beach, but we were so far out that they didn't even look at us. Story 24. Giving my notice to my boss last Friday. I'm across the country from any friends and family, and I have no job lined up. If I stay here, I'll wind up a shell of a person. So I'm quitting and moving back home with my only savings and the grace of my family to catch me. No going back now. Wish me luck. Story 25. I made a budget yesterday to figure out how much I'd need to move out. If I work two more hours than planned at a starter job I've lined up, I could do it easily with all the optional expenses. That's when it hit me that I'm not in college anymore, and I actually could have the money to live independently. Story 26. Guy in college said my name out loud as I had just finished writing it on the board to be put next to give a presentation. So I internally roll my eyes thinking, who's trying to bother me and why? Turned around, saw his gorgeous smile, felt something in my chest, and knew I was in for a ride. I messed it up, though. Story 27. When I decided to venture alone on a hiking trail through the Brazilian forest, realized there was no phone coverage after half an hour, kept walking for another hour, and finally saw a sign of civilization. A literal sign. Just that. It said, Beware of coral snakes. Story 28. Last summer, I replaced my roof, standing on the ladder at the corner of the house with a shingle stripping shovel. I just stood there for five minutes thinking if I wanted to do this or not. Then I ripped off the first few shingles, and there was no going back. Story 29. The positive pregnancy test. We were trying, but seeing the test, my first thought was, honestly, oh crap, what have we done? He's now eight months old, and it is the best, but still the scariest decision we've ever made. Story 30. Midway into my first, not for beginners, ski slope. I could stop and chicken out, but I continued. It was freaking amazing. Went for a second time, got injured 10 seconds before the end. Still worth it. Story 31. Signing the lease to an apartment with my long-distance girlfriend, moving six hours away from home. It's relatively not that bad, but no matter the outcome, my life won't be the same after this. Story 32. When I was about to get on the plane to my first semester of med school, my dad, never one for sentiment, said, Well, now you're actually worth more dead than alive. Don't screw this up. Story 33. That last step out the back door of a C-130. The last step was a doozy. No hookup, free fall. And a tie for first was when bullets started to come my way in Iraq. Stuff got real fast. Story 34. During takeoff on my first ever flight at the age of 30, I have a real intense fear of heights psychedelics, particularly DMT, because it all happened so quickly and intensely. Story 35. I saw this cute girl and wanted to ask her out. As soon as I said hi to her, I knew the only way to get out of it was to ask for her number. She was flattered, but said no. Story 36. When I called my roommate an idiot and she overheard me and said, what did you just call me? And I was like, oh crap, now I have to own it. I said, you're a freaking idiot. Story 37. When a guy kissed me for the first time after bar hopping with his friends, I knew I was in trouble. It's been three years now and he's snoring next to me. Story 38. I was renovating three apartments and a nine-bedroom house at the same time, by myself. Bam. Quarantine. I'm just gonna go for it. Story 39. 
getting off the bus and immediately getting there, yelled at the Great Lakes for Navy boot camp. Story 40. Me taking pictures of the North Korean military. If I was caught, I would be in a prison camp now. Story 41. Wife. Are you gay? Me. Yes. Story 42. When I finally gave in to the girl who wouldn't take no for an answer. Ah, oh, frick. Never again. Story 43. When I laid in the bed of my psychiatric hospital's bedroom for the first time. Story 44. Two days ago when we found out the wife is pregnant. Crap's getting real, boys. Story 45. Parachute jump. My life is now no longer in my hands. Oh well, Geronimo. Story 46. Told my mom I was a lesbian after she asked if I liked one of my guy friends. Story 47. Had this moment just now. Just handed in my bachelor thesis. Story 48. Packing up my car before telling my husband I was leaving. Story 49. Walking into an MMA fight and the cage closes behind you. Story 50. Every time I solo traveled and arrived in a new country. Story 51. Cutting the fenders for a wide body kit installation. Story 52. Heading towards a hedge at 30 miles per hour airborne. Story 53. When I came out of my mother's cervix. Story 54. Giving birth. I was not ready. Story 55. Canoeing over a waterfall. Story 56. Kissing my best friend. Story 57. Crossing the Rubicon. Story 58. Saying I do. Please leave your stories in the comments. I'd love to make a video of them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.